I'm Jesse McAnally. And I'm Andrew DeWolf. And I'm Brianna Jones. And welcome to Musicals with Cheese, a podcast where I try to get Andrew and Bri to like musical theater. How are you doing today? <laughs> Is that like, did I do the Dracula laugh thing? I don't know. And this okay. is a Halloween episode. Cue the music. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to do it until literally the cheese ratings in the last episode. So, you know what? I, I'm getting it out early. We're getting it out right now. It's Halloween time, and we're freaking spooked out of our boots. We're, we're scared shitless right now. We're scared Shrekless. Yeah. <laughs> hey, don't give away what we're talking about next week. Oh, <laughs> we're talking about Shrek again? Yeah, we're talking about the scared Shrekless uh, straight-to-DVD musical. musical. Yeah. Um, Andrew, how are you doing? Well, um, I just, uh, had to watch Dracula in German, uh, so, fantastic, Jess, how about you? Dracula by Frank Wilde! <laughs> Cue the music, Bree! Cue the music! I hear you before you speak, I'm with you wherever you From afar, the first time I saw your face, I knew I would make you mine. I felt a quickening of the pulse. I felt a shiver down my spine. Mina, you're the chosen one. Out of all the loves I've known in all my centuries alone. Ever since I saw your face, I've been trying to deny that I was hopelessly in love. That I could ever say goodbye. Now I know this can't be done. Now I'll turn away from love. I got a trigger warning really quick and now that we're coming out of the music for educational and reference purposes we will be using the 2011 studio recording of frank wildhorn's dracula now that's all fine and good but a couple of you people might recognize the guy that plays dracula who you might hear a lot through this as james barber um noted uh pedophile you know jess if you just never told me i wouldn't have known that um it is if that's triggering to you, I, I'm sorry. Just pretend it's someone else. It's a really shitty situation, but that's the only good. There's other good people on there. Norm Lewis is on there. There's a lot of other good people on this recording, but it's the only referential um, cast album that we've got. So that's what we're using, and I'm sorry. All right, on to the fun. Dracula the Musical is a musical based on the, on the original 1897 Victorian novel by Bram Stoker. Bram Stoker? The score is by Frank Wildhorn, From our Stroker. favorite, <laughs> our favorite person. <laughs> I hardly um, knew her. <laughs> <laughs> With lyrics and book by Don Black and Christopher Hampton, the show had its regional premiere at the La Jolla Playhouse in La Jolla, California, in 2001, playing to 115 percent capacity. Earning the highest paid capacity for any world premiere production in the Playhouse's history, Andrew. Yes, it is. But don't worry, we're going to get back on track. It then premiered on Broadway in 2004, starring Tom Hewitt as the vampire Count and Melissa Errico as the woman he loves, Mina Harker. A brief nude scene in which Dracula seduces Lucy Westerna, played by Kelly O'Hara, re received much publicity, as did the show's numerous special effects. Despite that, the show ran for only 154 performances. That's back on track, Frank Wildhorn, and received mainly negative reviews. The show was heavily revised and later engagements in Europe where it proved to be a hit. Just take it to Europe. We did it, guys. Wild, Wildhorn musicals usually endured critical derision, and Dracula would prove to be no exception. Reviews were universally negative, referring to the lyrics as unoriginal and to the music as monotonous and de derivative of both Andrew Lloyd Webber and Wildhorn's previous productions. When you're so bad, you rip yourself off. However, the new revised version that opened at the Garaz, Austria, in the summer of 2007 was very successful among critics and audiences. The version of the show is licensed by the Musical Theater International and is based on this production. A cast recording was released in 2008 and was a huge hit on the sales charts. So, it, it got there eventually, and just to be as fair as we can, we don't want to be intentionally, like, 
giving Andrew the worst thing possible and to like laugh at the bad thing. So I showed Andrew the 2007 production that is quote unquote the good one. You know, honestly, c- compared to like Jekyll and Hyde, this is like very good. This is like high quality. Can we <laughs> rank this among the other wild horns we've done? Uh, I mean, what have we? What else have we talk about? Bonnie we talk and Clyde. about Bonnie and Clyde, Wonderland, and Jekyll and Hyde, and this. And these were okay. mostly all requests by our wonderful $20 patron, Mina Maniri. And this is no different. Thank you, Mina Maniri. Thank you, Mina Maniri. Okay. Um, <laughs> if I had to rate them so far, I'm pretty sure... I literally can't remember anything about Wonderland other than that I hated it. Um, so I'm going to put that at the very bottom. Um, and then a little bit above that, I'll put Jekyll and Hyde, which I can remember some stuff from, but I did also hate it. Um, and then I'll put Dracula because this one was okay. And I think Bonnie and Clyde is the one I like the best so far. Bonnie and uh, Clyde is like an actually good show. It's a thing. Yeah. I'm going to put Bonnie and Clyde like a couple tiers above Dracula. There, there's like, a, there's like an empty space between those two that maybe, <laughs> maybe somewhere in the Wildhorn catalog, he's got something to fit that space. Uh, I doubt but as of, as of right now, it's kind of like a, oh, this one's pretty decent. And then like, oh, these are really, this is really boring. And then, oh, this is awful. <laughs> is Wonderland below Jekyll and Hyde? I would say so. I hated that one. I really didn't like it. <laughs> and remember, I once again, I played fair with you that time. I showed you the most recent London production while I watched the Broadway version that was originally, like, only lasted like a week. I, I just remember being confused and not understanding, like, what even happened, like, at all. And you didn't feel that way with Dracula. No. With Dra- and I, I even watched this in a different language. So, like, you'd think, if anything, I'd be really confused by this one. And I, I actually did not know the story to Dracula. It's not like I've seen a bunch of Dracula movies and I already know it. I've actually never seen anything <laughs> Dracula-related before in my life, which is a little bit surprising. I've seen, like, vampire content before, but not, not Dracula specifically. Um, okay, now now I'm very curious because I want to play this game. Andrew, tell us the plot of Dracula since you only have reference of it from this musical. Okay, if I am if I got it correctly, there is Dracula, who is uh, also referred to as Nosferatu in this, or something like Nosferatu that. Nosferatu is like the vampire The name, name. for, yeah, it's just for vampires. Yeah. Uh, but they, they sing Nosferatu a lot. They don't actually sing Dracula in English ever. <laughs> But he's out there and he's appearing to women and like luring them in. And he finds this one particular woman that he's really into. Uh, And most of the story is him and her trying to get together uh, and her like trying to resist him. But she has a friend that at first uh, gets lured in because I guess she has a a weaker mind or something. I don't really know why they played that, how they played that one up. Um, But she gets turned into a vampire and you meet uh, Van Helsing who has to kill that vampire and then starts to hunt the actual Dracula. And at the end, uh, at the end, the girl meets Dracula and Dracula decides, you know what? I'm not pure evil. I'm not going to turn you into a vampire. And then he gets he like kills himself. Is that the same ending as Jekyll and Hyde? (laughs) Kind of. Not really. I mean, in Jekyll and Hyde, isn't, like, the good version of Hyde, like, Jekyll, and and Jekyll's the one that kills himself? Yeah. Not Hyde. Like, in this one, the actual monster decides to do it. I mean, yeah. um, That's fairly correct. Um, But I kind of love, like, so I read the book, and I, when I was in high school, it was required reading for me. So this is very accurate to the book, and it takes a few as- uh, aspects from the Francis Ford Coppola film, which is also fucking bananas, but I love it. That one is that the like um a one that's fairly accurate to the book that came out in like the nineties. Yes, that one's fairly accurate. That's the one where he has like the weird fucking hair, right? Yes, yes, the butt cheek hair. Yeah. So it's not not like the very old Dracula that most people know. The Bella Lugosi. Yes, is Bella that right? Lugosi's film is not very accurate to the book. Yeah, it takes the elements it likes and it's like, oh, let's fuck the rest. Yeah, <laughs> which is interesting in its own way. And the book is in the be all end all, but this leans in very heavily. Same with the Coppola film to the romance between Dracula and Mina. Is this why Mina Maneri requested this? I think she requested it for for the for the wild horn aspect more than there's a character with her name. Well, a lead with her name. Um, but I'm 
I'd like the the cuckold aspect of it. Like, <laughs> what? So... <laughs> okay, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to run this. You're gonna have to run this one by in me. This story, like th- th- this entire story is based on like people cucking each other. Am I right? I mean, I think I'm right. You're gonna have to really run this one by me, because okay, I did so... not get this aspect. So we start with Jonathan Harker, Mina's husband, going to Dracula's castle and immediately yep. fucking all of his concubines, cucking well, yeah. his wife. Okay. Well, no, he's just cheating on. Because if his wife was being cucked, she would have been. She would be watching it and enjoying it. I guess, but also cucking means uh, it means you get to be a you become a cuckold when your wife cheats on you. Basically, that's it is, that's like the modern like you know YouTube conservative version of the word. Not exactly, <laughs> but kind of. <laughs> Um, but I'm I'm going with the YouTube conservative way just for for shit. You know what? We're ben, right? we're Ben Shapiroing it in here. Ben Shapiro. In Dracula, in... everyone everyone is a cuck in Dracula. I'm just saying, hypothetically. <laughs> no wet ass pee words. Pre- <laughs> um, but no, that happens, and then Dracula <laughs> comes in and is like, "Hey, I'm a fuck your girlfriend," and he's like, "Don't you fuck my girlfriend." And then the entire rest of the show is about Dracula trying to fuck Jonathan's girlfriend. <laughs> that that aspect is there in that relationship. Then we got Lucy and then her three suitors, where you got these three men all all wanting to fuck Lucy, and she could only pick one. And she, which one did she pick? She picked like the su- Seward, right? Am I wrong? I think so. Yeah, she picks him, and then the other two guys are just around. They stick around. <laughs> And they are the ones that also go to hunt Dracula in the end. Now, Dracula himself, I mean, everything he does is sexual in nature, I feel yes, like. Yes, it is. Because even even when he kills people, it's like he's like grabbing them and like sucking on their neck. You know, it's like that's that's pretty sexual. So, I mean, but, not only does he does he spend the entire plot trying to fuck this guy's uh, wife, he also fucks the guy yes, at the beginning. <laughs> It's it's wacky. Uh, I will say that it's a pre- it's a pretty weird experience to watch. This is a sex yeah. sexy show, but in an actual kind of sexy now, way, not in a fake sexy. I, way. That's that's not like a fault though, because I feel like Dracula is always supposed to be sexy and always was yes. supposed to be kind of sexy. So that's just accurate to the source material. That's not mm-hmm. a fault or like a strange thing or anything like that. Mm-hmm. And this one tries to characterize Dracula a lot. Like, a lot of them try to just pose as big bad that wants to fuck your wife. <laughs> like, drink your now, wife. Now, I, I kind of got the feeling that they did that because Phantom of the Opera was so popular, and they're like, monsters have to be sexy, and, like, she has to be into it. But is that in the book? It kind of is. It, well, let's talk about the book for a moment. The book isn't a narrative novel in the same way as, say, like, the Phantom of the Opera is a narrative. The, this yeah. is basically written as a series of letters and documents written from each other. So it's like a, a, found, it's a, found, footage. It's a found footage book. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So it's letters from Mina to Jonathan and Jonathan's like, and I'm going to go climb the roof today and I'm going to figure out what's up with Mr. Dracula and we're going to find this out. And Mina's yeah. like, I felt this weird feeling about Lucy. She was looking pretty weird. And the doctor's like, Lucy's going to fucking die. <laughs> <laughs> and like it, it is pretty interesting to read it from that point of view but it's also not crippled in the fact that it's a mystery like phantom of the opera is because yeah because i mean everyone knows what dracula is it's not right. like oh is he a vampire i don't know <laughs> so that is it's hard to understand what people actually think in that book like because you're not getting the internal monologue you're getting letters yeah which is which i guess leaves it a little more grounded uh, because it's not you don't you're not in their heads necessarily, which is um, also giving you leg room to make up whatever you want for them to say, which is what this musical does, and I think it works in its own favor. Yeah, I think the only thing that made me really feel like it was phantomized uh-huh. is the ending, because I don't think from the mild amount of research I was doing, that's not how the novel ends. No, it is not. <laughs> The novel doesn't end with Dracula being like, I actually love you and like, I can't possibly give you this curse, so I'm going to kill myself. Like, doesn't he just get killed by Van Helsing or, or one of his one of his guys? Yeah, yeah he just gets <laughs> like, so in the book and in the Francis Ford Coppola movie, he has to be shipped back to Transylvania in a box full of dirt. <laughs> 
it's because he's getting old again because he gets old when he's away from home and all that. So he's yeah. getting old and ugly and he's like, I need to be shipped in a box of dirt. <laughs> <laughs> and then they just break open the box and start beating the shit out of him. That's that's pretty funny, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. And it's anticlimactic as fuck. So emotionally, this this ending works a little better for me. But that is uh, a funnier yeah. ending. Um, have you have you seen What We Do in the Shadows? Of course I have, Andrew. Who Not the movie, to? though, the TV show. I've seen them both, yes. That, I, I feel like that does such a great job capturing the, like, gothic feel of vampires, and, and I kept thinking of that the whole time watching this. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Fair. Like, you could just bring Jackie Daytona in this. And... It's just, it, I don't know, it's hilarious. It's It's great. <laughs> I, I, don't I know. quote that I quote that fucking TV show at least once a day. Like anytime I see like some political ad, I'm like, she speaks the bullshit. The second season is just so good. I don't know. Yeah, I think like the first season really stood up to be greater than it had any right to be too. <clears throat> I think it was fine, but I think it, it kind of tracked the same moments as the movie did a lot of times. Uh, and the movie was better than the TV show, except for the second season. I think the second season was better. I think as a whole, I like the characters of the TV show more. Well, Dracula. Um, so we watched, I watched, I don't know what you watched. I watched the one that was entirely in German. So it was kind of difficult for me to understand what the singing and lyrics were a lot of times because it was mostly subtitles with German words. <laughs> <laughs> So the subtitles actually translated the German lyrics into English, but I have listened to both the Broadway, original Broadway, the bad one, as well as the recent English language 2011 version. And I think the songs are actually pretty good and have a good amount of variety to it. But let's not talk about that v quite yet, because I still want to yeah. talk about... The production design. Um, Europe puts a lot of money into their musicals because they really have faith in like the art. Um, we talked about this a little bit when we were talking about Hunchback of Notre Dame and how the Austrian production is like gigantic and beautiful. And when it came to the U.S., it was literally like boring. <laughs> it looked terrible. I, I will say the the very opening scene kind of caught my eye a bit with the like giant moving things that they were on. That was kind yes, of yes. It was so cool. Um, it, it gave the, it gave it a bit more of a gothic feel than they really could have if they were just on a stage and that's it. Um, though once they get down to the stage level, you kind of lose that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but like every, like in America, we get, we get used to like black box staging where it's like, just imagine where they are, where here is very yeah. <laughs> grounded of we are in a mansion and now we are going to Dracula's lair and now we're like, and it flows together very 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 nicely yeah and i think big sets are awesome and i i would like to see them uh be a thing you know, on broadway more so i there are a lot of shows that we watch where i'm just you look at the stage and it's just like just like a painted background and, and that's it and it's like all right you know in your head makes you appreciate like, shit like spongebob or beetlejuice yeah it's like i sometimes you want that big set and i feel like even even shows that are more dramatic and grounded and not like these big high concept shows could benefit with having really good set design it's like it's part of the show you know <laughs> i i agree um but i really really think that that added a lot to the overall quality of this now let's talk briefly about the characterization of van helsing I wanted more Van Helsing because I feel like I never really got a good characterization of him. They try. Oh, they try. So Van Helsing in the book isn't really anything. He's just a guy that shows up and has a general idea of what vampires are. Yeah, but then like pop culture, I think, turned him into kind of like this badass vampire hunter. Well, the Hammer Horror <laughs> movies did that. The, yeah. The Christopher Lee style, like Peter Which Cushing. is sick. And I mean, that's awesome. Yes. <laughs> And that just really wasn't what the character was. Um, in the Coppola film, um, he's played by Anthony Hopkins, who plays it as an insane person. Like, he literally is like, your wife is now the devil's whore! Does he, he just happen... It. Does he just happen to be correct? Or, like, he actually is correct? He just doesn't know how to conduct himself? Or He's correct, but doesn't know how to conduct himself. Okay. But he, like, as he says that, he's, like, humping a guy. He's like, you're the devil's whore! concubine to satan yeah you're really you're really convincing him out there changing hearts and minds man 
<laughs> yeah, you might have thought he was like uh, like he had COVID and it was popped up on a bunch of steroids and just saying some shit. Yeah, just like yelling like two words and then saying vote afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Pro life, vote! Devil's whore, vote! <laughs> Devil's whore, vote! <laughs> <laughs> but here, they kind of make they characterize him as a drug addict who's wife roseanne was murdered by dracula yeah i <laughs> that was not in the book and has never been in any production because in my opinion van helsing shouldn't have any relations he should just be a crazy guy that's obsessed with vampires yeah like i don't know i don't it's probably as you say it's definitely not in the book at all but like my interpretation of van helsing is like this guy who is just obsessive about killing yes. vampires and nothing else you know and I feel like if you're obsessed with vampires and you know their powers and shit, you probably wouldn't want to have any women around you. Because, like, that seems like a pretty big weakness since Dracula kind of pulls them in all the time. <laughs> well, I figure that Van Helsing really is asexual because, like, he would be that way because he's the only one that can survive Dracula's, like, sexy concubine. That's true. That's true, because it's not just women. Every Everybody is attracted to Dracula. Dracula right. is just, like, sex. <laughs> like yeah and i think that it, giving him that dark backstory one is just dumb because i don't think anyone needs like i had a wife you don't need to have a wife to be like hey maybe maybe dracula shouldn't be murdering yeah no he, he... and also I they didn't... named it roseanne which just has me thinking like roseanne Barr, who yeah, yeah. very lovely very kind um very sensitive roseanne Barr. she thought the bitch was white true I didn't remember that. That was, what, four years ago now? A thousand years ago. <laughs> that was 200,000 years ago. Good reference, Jess. Everyone will understand that one. <laughs> Look it up, kids! <laughs> what, should I have made a Home on the Range reference? What do you want? Home, home on the range. <laughs> or she was the cow on Home on the Range. What do you want from me, Andrew? I, I want to squeeze song. my Roseanne Barr joke in here because I had to pick the name Roseanne. When I order a little la <laughs> Everyone... No, no, we can't talk shit about Home on the Range. The director follows me on Twitter. Not yet. When it's time. We'll do it on Patreon <laughs> behind the paywall so that he No, no, no. We're getting, the, we're getting the director on and he's going to talk shit with us. <laughs> All right. Yeah. That's... Um, I think that we're, we, we, we... I think it's time for a mid show, kids. I mean, do we have anything else to say? I, I don't really think I have anything else to say. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Before we do a bit show, we got to go to our favorite segment of oh, Musicals with yeah. Cheese. It's the greatest, it's the best, it's Breeze Views. Oh, Andrew, tell write, us. Write a theme song so we can play it there. I, I'm trying to find time. I'm sorry. <laughs> God damn it, Andrew. I thought you liked this show. I thought you dedicated to this. Oh, my God. All right. Today on Bree's Views, the segment you love to forget. Um, okay. I've not forgotten no, it no, yet, you... though. Twice. What did, <laughs> what did the people's critics tell us? What did the people's critics tell us about this? Yeah, I'm sure that they're going to have a lot of nice things to say, because we know New York critics love Frank Wildhorn. The, the New York critics, they speak for the people. They speak for, <laughs> they speak for the common man. They know what we like. Do they? <laughs> okay. John Simon of New York Magazine says, But that music, it is like a long, uniform sausage made from made of sawdust cut into uneven slices, rhythm, with singing sometimes yelled, sometimes whispered, variety. <laughs> it is not so much composed as ground out, enough to give monotony a bad name and make one earn, uh, yearn for the melody of an Interrupting cell phone, Des McAniffs, is that his name? McAniffs? Yes. Okay. Direction is busy and bizarre, and the acting does what it can do to avoid being utterly ridiculous. In this, Melissa Erico and Kelly O'Hara come off best, and Stephen McKinley Henderson, grotesquely miscast as Ven Helsing, worst. <laughs> To put lyrically, Wildhorn has had his pimpies and jackies. Now let him have also his drackies and drekkies. Wow. John Simon. My God. What did that even mean? I'm trying to figure out what he meant by some of that. I feel like he was just like... Pimpies and jackies? 
Um, and trackies. He did a he did a musical called The Scarlet and Chimp- Pimpernel and then Jekyll and Hyde. Okay, and that, that's what he's calling their stupid teeny bopper fans. Uh, Matthew Murray of Talking Theater says, as frequently happens in Wildhorn composed shows, the songs here have but token connection to the action. <laughs> At least that is when they are intelligible. The sound design by Acme Sound Partners obscures at least a third of the lyrics and what can be understood is often undistinguished musically and lyrically. Few true theater scores can profit from a six-piece band with three synthesizers. Here's, here such a band seems sadly at home. Ben Brantley! <laughs> Boy, the piece of shit himself. May he rest in peace. He's isn't he? Is he dead? Is he still alive? Yeah, um, uh, uh, he stopped being in the New York Times, so we don't have to deal with him anymore. Excellent. Okay, Ben Brantley of the New York Times says, "And here it is, looming like a giant stuffed bat on a stick, the easiest target on Broadway, Dracula the Musical." which sets the familiar tale of old Snaggletooth to the familiar music of Frank Wildhorn, creaked open last night at the Belasco Theater. Belasco Theater. Belasco. Belasco Theater. Um, With all the animation, suspense, and sex appeal of a Victorian wax works in a seaside amusement park. That sounds fun to me. Yeah, I'd go to that. Um, (laughs) I'd want to fuck those wax works. (laughs) I want to go to a seaside amusement park. Hell yeah. And fuck the wax figures. <laughs> um, expectations were exceedingly low for the latest offering from the unstoppable Mr. Wildhorn, the composer of the expensively dressed clunkers, Jekyll and Hyde, the Scarlet Pimpernel. Is that how I say that? Scarlet Pimpernel. 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 And the Civil War. The Civil and... War. <laughs> That's one I know nothing about, but I am so curious. Well, the person well, I want to tackle it. the Civil War is fucking Frank Wildhorn, right? Mm. He knows what's up. <laughs> and expectations have not been disappointed. So go ahead. Take your shot. Say something if you must about the toothless or bloodlessness or the kindness of hammering stakes into the hearts of the of undead shows. Think of every appropriate variation you can involving the verbs to bite and to suck. Ben Brantley Ha-ha. sucks. And bites. Do, do, do. Do, do, do. do we do we agree with Ben Brantley? Uh I don't know. I don't think so. I, I don't know what version he watched though. Did he, he watched watch the Broadway the, version. The quote which unquote is the bad worst. one. Yeah, so I mean maybe. He's not always wrong. Sometimes the show just sucks. <laughs> I don't think this one sucks though. I think that this one, in, you can even see in the review, he doesn't actually say anything about the show. He just says, like, oh, well, Frank Wildhorn's other shows suck, so this one does exactly. too. <laughs> like, that's kind of what bothers me about New York Times reviews. They just kind of, like, they don't have a point often. <laughs> yeah, it's like, what was bad about it? Just that Frank Wildhorn made it? Like, that doesn't make it bad necessarily. They have too much flowery language for you to understand what the fuck they want to say. I think that's a lot of these reviews. I, I mean, this first review at least talks about the actors that are in it and saying that they're miscast and, and things like that. Actual, um, like, points to make. All right, let's take a mid-show and then we'll talk about whatever there is to say about the music. All right, let's go into a mid-show. Hey, sorry to interrupt you in the middle of the show, but we've got a shill at you. Today's show is brought to you by the extremely kind donations by our donors over at Patreon. Patreon is a place where you got a ton of cool things, where you got a full-on-ass podcast of your very own. You got where we talk about Fosse Verdon. We're about to talk about the Muppets movies. It's going to be a lot of fun on there. Um, Maybe Brie will even join us for a Muppet commentary or two. Mm, I don't know about that. She doesn't seem like she wants to. What? I'll do it. (laughs) Andrew, don't speak for me. Yeah, Andrew. God. But our current Golly. patrons are Melissa Goldman, Terry Needleman, John Donna, Max Lunig, Benjamin Lair, Lily Ackles, Peasant Chick, St- Justice Stampede, Ewan Cassidy, Task Gear, Fire, September, Monica Thoreau, Mina Maniri, Brent Black, Haley Murray, Allison Wonderland, B Way Flicks, Nathaniel, Stacey Coombe, Joseph Evans Green, Carrie Ahern, Uragale, Joy Whiter, Christine Malmadel, Cole Birchfield, Mary Lou Choquette, John Van Alls, Holly Stistically, Russ Walker, Musical Hell, Andrew Van Barson, Emily Stack, Tablam, Kyle Summers, Jen A. C., Kyle, Jess A., Skyler, Liz Lim, Corey Wilmark, Allison Stellar, Nothing. Nothing is certain, except Beth and taxes. Elizabeth, John Van Alst, Thesbian, 
Russ Cullen, Ren Cullen, Alex, Jamie Holland, Wait in the Wings, Lady Malvolia, Spectacle Machine, Will Lowery, Joke, Jacob Stroop, and Rafael Martinez Salaz. They give us a little extra financial support that helps us keep the lights on here, musicals with cheese, and keep Brie employed. And we love having Brie in our employee so much. We love her so much. If you'd like to join them in supporting us and get tons of fun perks, such as patron only commentaries, our episodes a day earlier, even earlier, come join us over at Patreon. Also, we got merch, 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 merch. Check the bio of this podcast to buy our merch. Or go merch. to musicalswithcheese.com and click the merch button. Buy that merch. Buy that merch. Buy that merch. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get back to the show. So, I find it very weird that really the first song we have is a duet between Mina and Jonathan. Down the road, coming round, over which we play, we stroll. I agree to go so far away. Will I ever see you again? I'll stare out to see until then. We, we were so happy here. My thoughts turn. They're the main characters. No, they're not. Shut up. Shut your whore mouth. No, that isn't true. <laughs> it is true. You got true. a little bit of a prologue, and then Dracula's like, I'm an old man living here in this castle. And then the first actual song we have is Mina and Jonathan being like, remember when we met over Whitby Bay? But they're like in different locations singing about it. Like they're not talking to each other. They're writing each other letters like in the book. Don't, I don't like it. I don't like it, Andrew. Oh, come on. You read the book. You even said it was a cool thing that they did in the book. You should have It you is. They this. also do that in the Ford Coppola movie, and I don't like it there. They literally put, like, the text on the screen as they write letters to each other. It's garbage. <laughs> <laughs> and Keanu oh, Reeves boy. plays Jonathan. It's really bad. Wow. That sounds He's, phenomenal. He tried to do a British accent and everything. Keanu mm. Reeves is America's hero. Not in the 90s, he wasn't. Um, But... What do you think of that Whitby Bay song? And do you think it's necessary? And if so, should it be in that section? I'm not really sure where else you would put it. Doesn't doesn't Jonathan die pretty early on here? No, he doesn't die. He just gets, like, wounded and then sent home. Oh. Oh, no, you're right. I don't know what I'm thinking. Yeah, Andrew, you stop smoking the crack. Smoke the crack? <laughs> Smoke um, that crack rock, baby. I was born this way. Yeah, I don't know. Like, these two are such a lame couple, like, as it is, because you never even really see them do much. You more, you're more looking for the, the Mina and Dracula couple. Yeah, and... we want to get to the get to the fireworks factory, and it takes 17 minutes before Dracula to really step in and stop being old man Dracula. Why are they going to get to the fireworks factory? <laughs> yes, um, and a song I actually really like, um, Fresh Blood, where Dracula comes in and finds all his concubines. Yeah. All over Jonathan Harker, and he's like, Bitches! The fuck? He was mine. And they're like, and he brings them a baby, and she they just tear it apart. It's fucking <laughs> hilarious. Like, I wish that was like the second song. Like, Jonathan's like, I'm going to this house. Oh my god, concubines. And then they throw oh a baby god. and tear it apart. I like when uh, Dracula keeps getting younger after each one of uh, people he uh, eats. I love that too. Yeah, and first he eats he eats uh, Jonathan. Yeah, he sucks Jonathan's blood, and he's like, "All right, just enough, not too much. I I need to send him back." 
I'm surprised he doesn't just suck him dry. I think I guess he it's... has a thing for Mina already at this point, or at least it's so. He's like, he's he like, if I if I kill this guy, there's no way she'll come to me. Right, she won't forgive yeah. me if I kill her husband. So he's like, all right, I'm young enough to be fuckable. Now I'm gonna go after this Mina girl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but in the song Fresh Blood, um, where he's like, Fresh blood to revive me, da 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 The children of the night, those who hide themselves from light, can you not hear the secret music? I am the master of the boyard, I summon them from near and far to make intoxicating music. But it's time now to leave them. I must follow my plan. I shall have to believe them. I need pastures new. What I'm needing is fresh blood to revive me. Fresh blood in my veins. No one will survive me in those dark souls. Um, what did you think of that, Andrew? <laughs> Actually, I think this was the first song I kind of liked. A lot of these songs feel so lame, and I think that's kind of a, a wild horn special, is <laughs> like just songs that really just do not make you interested in anything that's happening at all. Um, I think this comes fairly close because it's like he just fed yeah. a baby to a bunch of women, like that. Well, yeah, and you got you kind of get into it that way, and and it's like, ooh, is Dracula gonna kill somebody? Ooh, I gotta watch. I agree. Um, but it, it it's the closest thing to like a live like let's frame it like this Jekyll and Hyde to get to a song like this as intense as this it takes to the end of act one <laughs> yeah and Jekyll and Hyde is a snooze all through act one. Oh my god Say they don't have about this. That... this is not a snooze fest <laughs> at least not in the same way yeah um okay then we get to oh, what's the next like actually good song i want to talk briefly about how do you choose lucy's song yeah yeah where so, she's trying to figure out who she wants to marry yes how do you choose one of them is brave one of them is bright one of them is boring at the ballet one of them was sweet one of them was sad one of them was snoring quincy's accent gives me goose flesh jack's rich voice holds me in Whereas Arthur never opens his mouth at all. What's to be done? Living on a ranch, learning how to nurse. Marrying my neighbor. Who do you love? Which of them is kind? Which of them is fun? Isn't this hard labor? Quincy Royds or Palomino? Jack saves lives and cuts up frogs. Yes, um, this song is a pastiche, which I've never really heard Wildhorn do like a classical music pastiche, which is a little weird to hear. Still feels very poppy in its way, but... Well, I mean, Weber did it, and Wildhorn wants to be Weber, so... He really does, and Weber's not even that good. <laughs> yeah, so like, I, I can kind of understand why he would do it. I don't think it sounds terrible, though. I think for this song, it works really well. It shows Lucy as a character very well. And it's a funny song, like Wildhorn doing humor kind of works. Who would have thunk? Yeah, no, and and this is one of the songs that aren't isn't like a complete uh, sedative, you know. <laughs> Jesus Christ, Andrew! <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I had a lot of trouble really getting into the music in this. I really did. I mean, it's Frank Wildhorn. I'm trying my best here, Andrew. You know, yeah, but it's like it's Dracula and it's gothic vampires, and and the best you can do is like. The same thing that I've heard a hundred times from your other shows? Like, come on. Oh, just you wait, Andrew. Just you wait till we talk about that. And that's like, that. honestly, when we talk about Wildhorn, the reason Bonnie and Clyde was so okay and, and, like, watchable is the music in that doesn't sound like all of his other shows. Well, that was a challenge brought to him by, like, the producers where they were like, you cannot write a single ballad that you're trying to also sell to, like, fucking a pop star. You have to write songs that are about these situations. And they were yeah. like, Okay, fine. <laughs> but it's like, you got this gothic thing, like, give me some, like, you know, I don't know, lightning crack or thunder crack and da -da -da, da -da 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 -da. like, I don't know. Give me something interesting to cling to here. <laughs> 
let's talk a little bit about Loving You Keeps Me Alive, which is Dracula's like big yeah. music of the night number where he's like, uh, I, I, I feel if I loving you keeps me alive, then how can leaving me be right? You know, that nagging man bullshit. Yes. Time I set eyes on you. I knew I'd never be the same. I never knew I'd get such pleasure whispering your name. If loving you keeps me alive, then how can leaving me be right? Turn back and let me love you. Stay with me and let us dance into the night. You are the one, the only one to make me see. know it's it's nice to get dracula to to give us some motivation here <laughs> it is nice and you kind of get why he's into it i also love the actor thomas brochart um who play like he has a great voice for it especially when he's yes he, he's great when he's not singing as bad like his vo he has a very nice singing voice but when he's like actually talking to people he sounds terrifying especially when he's like renfield you have disappointed me it is incredible oh <sighs> I, I don't know. I think, uh, and I this think song has since become a standard. Um, I wanted to say in like male baritone singers, like almost every one of them has this song on their album. Gotcha, gotcha. I kind of like Nosferatu. Let's talk about that now. I, I I put a pin in that earlier. We're gonna p pull that pin out and put it right here. All Is right. this a bad song? Do you hate this one? I kind of like this one, to be honest. No, I, I don't mind the song. The song is fine, but it was also <laughs> fine when I heard it the first time in Jekyll and Hyde. Really? I didn't catch that. What, what song yes. is this in Jekyll and Hyde? So, so right here, we're going to talk about a song from Jekyll and Hyde called His Work and Nothing More. Have your work and nothing more. You are possessed. What is your demon? You've never been this way before. You've lost the fire you built your dream on. There's something strange, there's something wrong. I see a change, it's like when love dies. I who have known you for so long, I see the pain in your eyes. And then we're gonna go to Nosferatu in Dracula, which is many years later. The bee, when he stings once, he dies, but not the Nosferatu. No, he, his powers grow, he drinks the blood and lives again. And the blood brings back his youth, the cruel and evil Nosferatu, and gives to him the strength of twenty men. Same melody, literally the same He melody. can change his... I think the lyrics are better. Yeah, the lyrics are better, but literally he just took a song from his other musical and put it into this musical and expected us not to notice. Yeah, he did that. And he also made it like one of the main themes. Yes, he did. Because <laughs> <laughs> this boy, one comes I... back all the time. A lot. Like over and over. But when I first heard it, like, because it plays in the prologue, I'm like, did I just hear your work and nothing more? And then it comes back again I'm, as an actual song. I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. But this is like the Van Helsing song where he's explaining what vampires are. Yes, he explains. And it's taken actual lines from the book, like the bee dies when it stings, but not the Nosferatu. Like that's a literal word for word from Stoker's book. Yeah. And the, there's only two other musicals that I see that do that well. I think this one does it all right. But I think Paul Gordon's Jane Eyre does a great job at translating like the actual text of the book into lyrics in a way that still feels like poetry. Yep. And of course, Natasha Pierre in the great Comet of 1812 does that perfectly too. In cats. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that doesn't do a good job. That's a bad, bad job, Andrew. I, I think, I think you need to get your brain checked. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Think you think you might have a case of the idiots. Well, I mean, at least he was able to salvage something from Jekyll and Hyde. <laughs> <laughs> and that's as positive as Andrew gets. All right, let's talk about Life After Life, the Act One Closer. 
It's a matter of time before London belongs to us. Every night someone new. Every victim a midnight feast. Yeah, which is weird that they close Act 1 with Dracula and Lucy and not Dracula and uh, Mina. It makes sense to me because, as we say, you should end Act 1 on what's going to bring people back, um, basically a cliffhanger. And this is like, he finally brought someone back from the dead. That is the cliffhanger. He brought a dead woman to life again, and they're about to wreak some havoc. You know, I wish they went over the rules a little more. So, in order to turn someone else into a vampire, he has to make someone drink his blood? Yes, they, he has to drink their blood, and they have to drink his blood. Okay, what if someone just drinks his blood? What happens? Um, I don't know. I think it's like a ritual thing. But that was from the book as well. That is not a musical original. And they okay. don't explain it well. Once again, it's all, it's all in letters, so they just walk in, and they see Mina drinking out of, like, or Lucy drinking out of his, like, cut open body, and she's drinking out, he's drinking out of hers. And they're like, what's going on here? It's a bit crazy to think that, like, back then, that this must have been such a scary book to read. <laughs> probably was it was like oh my god did they really write these letters oh my god is this real yeah it's like legit found footage <laughs> my god. but what do you think of the song itself life after life i think his song's actually pretty cool sounding um it didn't stick with me hugely <laughs> i think just the mixing of the voices like the specific yeah. vocal timbre of lucy and dracula like and the plan of like yeah we're gonna fuck shit up and you better stick around for act two because we're gonna fuck things up and then she like dies immediately in act two. <laughs> yeah, they just cut her head off, and it's just like, like, all oh, right, fuck this bitch, stab her, cut that head off. And then Helsing's like, yep, we did it. All right, all right, job well done. We gotta save Mina now and get this motherfucker. I want to be a vampire hunter. That'd be so cool. I mean, did you see <laughs> um, the 2004 Van Helsing movie with musical icon huge jackass? Uh, I'm not gonna watch that. It looks like shit. It's not great. I- the 2000s, and I've been saying this for a long time, the 2000s were the worst decade ever to happen. I don't have anything to refute that, but I like The Dark Knight. Sure, maybe. The 2000s <laughs> sucked. If anyone has a refutation to the 2000s being the worst, nobody. The movies looked like shit. It was back when like CGI was like garbage, and they had this like dark emo thing going on where like every movie had to be like pitch black. It was awful. I hate the 2000s. And then you got like apple bottom jeans, boots with the fur. The whole club is looking apple at her. Apple bottom jeans. <laughs> ah. Um, I feel like the only movie I remember from the 2000s is Rugrats Go Wild. Is that the only movie that came out? Yeah, that might have been the only movie that came out. In the <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's the only movie that came out. <laughs> it's the only one worth salvaging from that decade. <laughs> Andrew, do you remember the Patreon podcast where we just spent the entire time instead of talking about Glee, how much you, the only VHS you had was Rugrats in Paris? Yeah, Rugrats in Paris was great. That one was good too. <laughs> is maybe that's the movie I'm thinking of? Rugrats Go Wild? No, Rugrats, Rugrats Go Wild go is with, with um, the, the, the Wild, wild Thornberries. Thornberries. The, yeah, that's that yeah. the, the original Avengers. Of. Yeah, and the yes. Wild Thornberries like that's like a racist thing now, right? You can't talk about that anymore. Why? Because Tim Curry said said something problematic. What happened? I don't know. I just feel like the the whole white people and and teaching the natives kind of thing isn't that racist now? They just saw animals. Like literally, the point was that she talked well, to what animals. What about the well? What about the little boy that they're teaching how to talk? Like, come on. That was a white kid that was thrown into the wild. <laughs> that was a feral boy, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> a feral boy. <laughs> They did a whole episode like, well, how did he get there? These British people came and they fucked around in the wild. Their parents got <laughs> murdered. And he just left to roam around the fucking jungle alone. It's still racist. <laughs> Against the fucking Brits. 
Yeah, you can be racist against white people. It's fine. Yeah, just ask Ben <laughs> Shapiro. And now for a surprise cameo, Ben Shapiro! Hey, okay. You want me to talk about the wild thornberries as Ben, ben Shapiro? Yeah, that was I don't, what I, I was think queuing I, up. I don't think I can do that, guys. I don't have, like, a rant prepared. Damn. All right, maybe. <laughs> Let's say, let's say hypothetically that you were a British person and you dropped off your child in the wild. And let's say, hypothetically speaking, that some Australians came and uh, they found your British child and they just decided that they were going to raise him and teach him how to be Australian. Um, this is racist. This is not okay. Uh, you're being racist against the British ethnicity. Uh, Australians are not British and uh, that has always been true. Uh, there's no refuting that. That's facts. That's not feelings. Uh, I don't know. I got nothing else here. <laughs> Where did you get them being Australian from? I don't know. I'm just making shit up. <laughs> All right. Before we move away from Rugrats Go Wild, um, Bruce Willis voiced Spike the dog in that movie. <laughs> Wait, and aren't, aren't the Rugrats Australian? No. <laughs> and he had to do press interviews for the Rugrats Go Wild and it's obvious he did not understand the film he was in nor did he watch it. He's like yeah it was the dog. No it was like what was the it's like these kids because you know it's the Nickelodeon kids like so what was the hardest part of playing Spike the dog and he's like you know he's a dog man like dog it's a dog so <laughs> it was a dog See, Tim, uh, Tim Allen would have taken that like a champ. He would have been like, yeah, I'm the shaggy dog in the shaggy dog movie. Um, you know what? You know what? You know what? Shaggy dog is the only movie with actual conservative values in current America. <laughs> they keep canceling all the conservative values from you know, our TV shows. It's like shows. fucking Nazi Germany in Hollywood. You can't have a conservative belief without being thrown out into the fucking gulag. Yeah, it's like I'm just it's like Nazi Germany. I'm just coming in, I'm like, I just want to make a show where I hate black people and they just don't let me do it anymore. Why can't I say <laughs> the N-word? <laughs> it's like Nazi to Germany. To infinity and beyond. <laughs> <laughs> Literal things he has said. Like none of this is like us exaggerating. <laughs> <laughs> wait hold on i need to check to see if his website is still insane his website's never gonna be updated don't even <laughs> uh, <laughs> everyone do yourself a favor and go to timallen.com and you will be better off for doing it. <laughs> <laughs> it is it really is so great it is just amazing <laughs> Can we, that. Just, just, can you just describe it really quick for us? It is like a mosaic <laughs> painting of Tim Allen as Santa Claus and just like four links, live shows, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, and the words Tim Allen. But no, no you, you're like missing, it's mosaics, but it's also like heavily pixelated and zoomed in way too far. <laughs> yes. And he looks like Santa Claus is about to fucking cut himself or something. He looks sad. It's just, it does not look good. It's not a good look. Arr, arr, arr. All right, let's move on to Deep in the Darkest Night. Wait, which one is the <laughs> Deep in the Darkest Night? Oh, my goodness. And pray God will show us a sign. Deep in the darkest night, when there's no spark of hope, we must be points of light, piercing the darkness, bright as the stars in an indifferent sky and in a golden star when the hope is gone we'll raise our heads and we'll journey on when the great battle commences yeah yeah i didn't i didn't care <laughs> this one it is something I wanted to bring up because it does sound pretty and it is like an actual plot relevant song where they're like, we are going to do this thing and like, here's our goal. It, it sets would be up the so final scene much, pretty well. It'd be so much more plot relevant if they actually ended up killing Dracula. It would have been. And I feel like in an early version, they probably did end up like, hey, let's fuck up Dracula. Instead of Mina being like, I love you. And he's like, I can't damn you to this life. Blech. Yeah, speaking of, can we talk about There's Always a Tomorrow? <laughs> um, briefly, um, after we talk about The Longer I Live. I've seen so many sunsets in my life 
I should know everything there is worth knowing. But since I saw your face, I don't know where I am. There's no map that can show me where I'm going. The longer I live, the more I wonder if I know anything at all. If I've ever been in love, I can. That I have all the answers right I'd give all my yesterdays for one more night it's hard. What do you got? Um, Dracula's final solo number before, before he becomes an hero Yes. <laughs> Where basically his discovery of, you know, I've lived too long and I have hurt a lot of people. And you know what? Maybe it's best that I just do it all in. You know, when you say it like that, Dracula, I think you might be right. <laughs> <laughs> it is a weird, like, there was no, like, discovery. It's just like, oh, Mina's coming. You know what? Maybe I don't deserve to live. <laughs> oh, my my entire goal of the entire musical is finally about to happen. Maybe I don't deserve this. Dracula's yeah. got like major imposter syndrome. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Drac, Drac, don't, don't, you don't need imposter. Yo, syndrome. Drac, You're great. Look how young you look. I mean, sure, it's other people's blood, but like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very short song. Um, like, it's a weird like. It's empty lyrics for one, like like most Frank Wildhorn outings. The lyrics mean nothing. Like the final lyrics are: "The longer I live without you near me, the longer the empty years will be. The world will not turn until you turn to me. My world will not turn until you turn to me." And then he's like, "Guess it's time to die." <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. I'm sorry. I just wanted to talk about how pointless a song that is. How it comes out of nowhere and is supposed to affect the overall theme on Dracula's final action. Yeah, which also kind of comes out of nowhere. Yeah, but now let's talk about There's Always a Tomorrow. I was born to love you. I was born to need you. These are simple truths that I try to betray. If you truly love me, boy dracula and mina meet up and, and mina's like i love you and dracula's like i love you too that's why you we cannot be together and then he dies it feels very romance novel-esque you know yeah i think it's a shitty ending to be honest i don't like no it. shit <laughs> it's a dracula like dracula's not supposed to like give up and just be like oh maybe turning people into vampires is bad <laughs> um i mean the th- <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, this show goes out of its way to try to show that Dracula is the all right guy. <laughs> it's like, no, Dracula's not an all right guy. Dracula is a murderous, actual monster that is aligned with Satan. <laughs> <laughs> but 
who did he kill in this musical? Like, he killed Renfield, maybe, but Renfield fucked him over and he was kind of useless anyways. He killed Lucy? No, Lucy got killed by the guys. By he the boys. Made, he turned Lucy into a vampire. Yes, but that he's a vampire. He's just making her live forever. As he says, like, he, like, literally stops by... <laughs> Um, Mina's house, and he's like, "You killed Lucy." He's like, "No, Lucy's good. She's out there fucking about." What are you talking about? I killed her. I killed her. I just turned her into a monster that has to kill others to survive. <laughs> What's wrong with that? I mean, if Twilight <laughs> could do it and it'd be romantic and literally a huge plot point, why can't this do it and say, yeah, but Twi- no, Twilight has like vegan vampires. Like you can't like Twilight's not a vampire story. Okay, the vampires in that don't have to drink blood or anything. They do have to drink blood. They just don't have to make it human blood. Yeah, which is stupid. <laughs> I guess. Um. All right. Also, I how guess... many people has Dracula killed before this happened? I mean, come they, on. They don't confirm it. None of them are hashtag confirmed. All of his vampire brides are dead. I mean, vampires are undead. If they're vampires, he killed them. <laughs> but do you have to be dead to be a vampire? And if yes. so, like, what, what does death even mean? Death is when your soul leaves this plane. Dracula and, and all of them are, are are marching husks controlled by imps. <laughs> <sighs> all right, Andrew, what is your overall thoughts on Dracula the Musical and your cheese rating? Um, Dracula the Musical was not terrible, albeit a bit boring, a little bit snoozy. Um, yeah. I feel like it, the music itself is kind of what holds it back in a lot of ways. It's just kind of a lot of the songs feel a bit meandering and don't really have the power or impact that I'd like them to have. I'm not really sure. I don't know what it is about Wildhorn's music. I feel like there's not enough movement in the music itself. It, it always just feels like stagnant, and I'm not a huge fan of that. Yeah, and it's also a specific type of music. Like, in the early aughts and late 90s, maybe it was pretty new on Broadway, but now it's like everything kind of sounds like this. Yeah. So, as far as, like, do I recommend it? I'm sorry, Mina Maniri. I don't think I can. Mina Maniri. Andrew just doesn't like you. I wonder who has it worse. Joseph Evans Green or Mina Maniri and recommendations for us. Yeah. Um. So, as far as uh, cheese, I'm going to give it... Uh, jeez. I wish I had, like, a good cheese from, like, uh, Transylvania, but... I don't think that's a real place. I feel like that may- they made that up for Dracula. So uh, Transylvania is a real place. Transylvania, I'm pretty sure, is fictional. It's a vampire location. It doesn't really no, exist. No, 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 no. It's um, a real place, Andrew. So I'm going to give it Goya cheese, just because. <laughs> All right, Bree, how do you like our discussion? Um, well, I don't want to watch the musical now. I will say that. Um, you didn't you want to listen watch to some it of the songs, I will say. Um, no, but after reading the reviews, I was like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> um, but for a cheese, I'm going to give you guys a, mm, oh, a head cheese, which is not cheese at all. It is a cold cut that uh, originated in Europe. And I just, I don't know. I think it seems fitting. It makes sense because Lucy's head gets cut off. Yeah. That's and fair. I would know that because I watched the musical. Totally. No, you all read right. the book. Uh, yeah, that's what it is. I wrote the book. No, this musical isn't good. I I get it. But also, I kind of have a soft spot for it. It sounds cool. I like a lot of the songs. I will listen to the cast album and not skip any of the numbers. Um, I don't know what it is about Frank Wildhorn, but he does hit like a specific spot in my guilty pleasure bone where I'm just like, I can enjoy this even though I know it's garbage. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I like watching Jekyll and Hyde. Is Frank Wildhorn, is he like the, uh, oh, what is that guy's name? Ed Wood of musicals? A little bit, but Ed Wood never got <laughs> success, and kind of Frank Wildhorn has. Like, he did a Death Note musical in Korea. Like, the guy is fucking weird and has, like, a strange career that I actually would love someone to analyze. Not me. I got too much other shit to do. But either way, um, I gotta wrap this up. So, the cheese I am picking is a Dracula cheese sculpture, um, which I am gonna show you guys. Uh, because I think it's funny looking. What type of cheese is it made out of? It is made... Oh, it's, it's the butt hair one. Yeah, it's the butt hair one. It does not decompose or get moldy, <laughs> which is a great sign, if you ask me. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, it doesn't say it, but they have a video of how it was made. If you want to pay 
$183.60 to get your own very own cheese sculpture of Dracula. That's my cheese rating. You got it. I, I won. <laughs> I won the cheese ratings. Um, good, good, good luck, Juliet. Um, tell me I won. Be sure to say I won in the cheese rating list that you make. And be sure to rank Bree and Andrew as losers. <laughs> uh, oh, well. But you know who isn't losers? Our lovely folks over at Patreon. You're right, our wonderful folks at Patreon. Thank you guys for listening. Please, um, like, follow us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, at Musicals and Cheese. If you could leave us some reviews on Apple Podcasts, that would mean a lot. We gotta catch up with that with that f- fucking One Small with Dragons podcast. We need to get get more reviews than them. Um, our Twitter is Cheesy <laughs> Musicals. Our Patreon is Musicals with Cheese. Our Instagram is Musicals with Cheese. Our YouTube page is Musicals with Cheese. We have a patron-only podcast that is Patreon with Cheese, and I think we're talking about the Muppets at this point. We have to be if we're on schedule. Muppets! Yeah, we're going to have some fun times there. Um, our email is musicaltheaterlives at gmail.com. Our title card was created by Jolene Casco. Go send her some love at Jolene Casco. Um, this this show is produced by the wonderful, the incredible, the probably not a vampire, Brianna Jones. Yeah, Brianna. Woo. Play some Vuvuzelas here. and like Vuvuzelas. Vuvuzelas. <laughs> Venezuelas. Play it now. Uh, <laughs> Thank you to the Broadway Podcast Network for having us on the platform. We love you to death. You're a great, great group. And thanks for not kicking us off yet for, for Andrew being horribly misogynistic. Um, Excuse me. Um, I just want to step in and say that my wife is actually a doctor and I cannot possibly be misogynist, she said. All right. Thank you guys for listening. <laughs> we love you so much. Um, we'll see you next time on Musicals with Cheese. <laughs> Life after life, there'll be no blooded on your grave. No tears, no fears, I have no mortal soul to save.